Tonight, two high earners are taking a gamble on a new career, but there's a lot to learn. Do you not think that it, you need to be a bit more with it? You're not going to like these handles, isn't are you? It? It's a Victorian house. No, I mean 1980s, not 1880s. <laughs> <laughs> on 150,000, you haven't got a hope in hell of actually achieving this sort of finish. In today's more stagnant market, giving up a lucrative career to launch into property development is a seriously risky business. But that's exactly what tonight's two developers are going to do. Former IT sales manager David Hollingworth thinks developing full-time is the way to get a better quality of life. He's pinning his hopes on this four-bed Victorian terraced house in Crouch End, North London. Ex-dentist Rebecca Lang also wants a more flexible lifestyle. She's bought a 1970s detached family home in Poole in Dorset. Surprisingly, this is one of the country's most expensive places to live and she wants to cash in. I think that the property that I'm developing will achieve the money that I want simply because there's no nicer place to be in Britain. You know, it's a lifestyle, I think, that you're selling as well as just a property. With such an impressive range of well-designed luxury homes on the market, Rebecca's up against stiff competition. But what she's bought is this. You've got a a house which some people would consider to be quite unattractive, probably. I mean, I think with a mix of old brick, new brick, a bit of stone cladding, a bit of rendering, you've got pretty much every type of building material you could, you could have. But it's got loads of potential, hasn't it? It has. I knew that I didn't want an old period property. I was looking for something around 1970s era. I just right. felt that that was the ideal property to turn into a very contemporary-looking home. It's a good strategy. Going for a less attractive building and bringing it up to the standard of its neighbours can really add value. But this house is not only dated, it's big. And Rebecca's got adventurous ideas. The massive amount of work she's planning is not going to be cheap. Rebecca bought the house for £405,000 and has a budget of £150,000. She hopes to sell for £650,000, which would give her an impressive £95,000 profit. These are huge figures, but I don't think even her £150,000 budget is big enough for her massive plans. At the moment, the house has an uninspiring four bedrooms, two reception room layout spread over two floors. Rebecca wants to create an impressive designer home and it will be almost unrecognisable. She's giving the front of the house the facelift it desperately needs, adding a two-storey extension. The new extension will mean a lot of extra space, giving her four big bedrooms and two bathrooms on the first floor. But she's not stopping there. Rebecca's also adding a whole new storey where she'll have a large master bedroom and bathroom suite. Rebecca's right to want to create an impact, but this is not the way to do it. Surely the master suite should be on the same floor as all the other bedrooms. My feeling is the master suite's got to be the largest space out of all the bedrooms, and upstairs you're going to have that big space. You're going to have sloping rooms. Yes. So actually, in terms of usable space, you probably could end up with a bigger master bedroom down here than up there, although it will feel bigger because you'll see more yes. floor. I think you want a master suite down on this floor because you, you want the parents of the family to be able to be on the same floor as their children. The key to good developing is knowing what will appeal to your market and downstairs she has some good ideas. The basic layout remains broadly the same, but Rebecca will have a more contemporary open-plan kitchen breakfast room with a modern glass sliding door leading through to a revamped sitting room. As well as this vast living area, the big new extension will give her an additional reception room, making this one very large, spacious house, but with a rather unusual garage. And this is storage? Um, yes, it is, moment. yes. 
I'm actually going to put double garage doors at the front. So it actually looks like a double garage. Right. Um, but you won't get a car in this way. You won't it? get a car in this way. It's something I have thought long and hard about. But I feel that nowadays most people don't use their garage for cars. It's a great big driveway at the front. It's got lots of off-road parking. And I just feel it would be better used as storage. I think it's a very bad impression to set somebody who's going to come and look round that they see double doors of a garage come in and think, oh, we can't fit a car in anyway. Yeah. I think their initial thought will be, well, what else doesn't work in the house? <laughs> In a property this size, in this area, buyers expect and will pay good money for a decent-sized garage. She could easily create one by simply changing the layout. But I wonder exactly who this house is for. I'm thinking, well, if it was my house, how would I want to use the space? And I would actually want this as two separate rooms. But perhaps it's me being blinkered because I have so many children and other families might not have quite so many kids. <laughs> Rebecca's risks are high. The stakes would be huge for anyone, but she's a single mum with four children to support. She's bravely sold their family home, given up her job, and invested all the family savings in this development. I'm looking forward to standing here, looking up at the uh, house and thinking, that looks good, I've done a really good job of this. Let's, let's hope I achieve it, hey? <laughs> Not only has Rebecca taken on a massively ambitious project, but I think she's totally under-budgeted. She's taking one hell of a gamble. And she's not the only one. In Crouch End, North London, David Hollingworth has quit a successful job in IT. I just imagine this is my ex-boss. <laughs> He's put his family's life savings on the line and remortgaged their home in order to buy this four-bedroom Victorian terraced house. There's a lot riding on it for David and his family. And his wife, Christine, is yet to be convinced it's the right move. This is the largest amount of debt we've ever had in our lives. And we're probably the least solvent we've ever been in our lives because in our household of four, there's only me working. It's paramount really that this project is successful because we are looking to make this uh, you know, a yeah. major source of income. So yes, it's absolutely vital that we make a, make a profit. David's given himself just eight weeks to turn this place around. A good strategy, if he can pull it off. If I could do probably two or three a year, which I know is quite a, quite a difficult challenge, then I think certainly the opportunity is there to, to make as much, if not more money, than I was in IT. He's starting as he means to go on. He bought the house at auction for £329,000 and has a budget of £67,000. He's hoping to sell for £450,000, which would leave him with a £56,000 profit. But this means breaking the ceiling price of the road by a staggering £20,000, which is a big gamble when there's so much at stake. I sort of fluctuate like a roller coaster between being very optimistic about it and then having a sudden panic in which I'm very, very pessimistic. I think it can't possibly work. We've made a terrible mistake. In North London, David Hollingworth has given up a highly paid, stressful job hoping for a better quality of life as a developer. I was hating my job. So I took a step back and actually thought, what would I re you know, do I really want to do this for another 20 years? His strategy for success relies on breaking the ceiling price of this road in just eight weeks. It's an ambitious target, so his plans have got to be spot on. Who are you planning on selling this to? Well, I think the target market for this is probably going to be someone moving out of a flat, probably a young couple, possibly with a young child, or certainly looking to start a family, basically looking for more space. I mean, I definitely think this is a family area, and this will sell to the family market. So I think that's that's the area you should be really targeting. This house could be perfect for the family market, but I'm not sure David's ideas go far enough. On the ground floor, there's a double reception room which needs modernising, and a small dark kitchen with a loo and utility room at the back. 
In order to create a family kitchen, he's knocking through and adding ever-popular French doors onto the garden. But he's losing the loo, which in a family house like this is not ideal. It's an important to get a, a downstairs loo in, into a family house, and this is going to be a family market. And I think you can probably fit a downstairs loo in the space you've already got by making a smaller door to the cellar. The cellar is, after all, only storage. The space under the stairs is big enough for a loo if David moves the door to the cellar. That would be excellent if we could do that. That would be, be quite a good, a good solution, I think. It ticks a box and people are more likely to want to buy this house than another house. Upstairs, David's also forgetting his market. He plans to turn four small bedrooms into three larger ones, but he's sticking with only one small bathroom, which is a problem. But again, there's an easy solution. I would be tempted, if I was you, considering the room proportions to get an ensuite in here. Victorian terraces of three bedrooms don't tend to lend themselves to having a bedroom with an ensuite bathroom as the master suite and then a separate further bathroom. So if you can achieve it here, it'll make this house stand apart. I think that would be a good idea, whether we need to do that and, and the downstairs cloakroom as well. So you uh, if you do both, you've got the ultimate layout for a family house, haven't you? Yes, I mean, it's a question then of the extra five to ten thousand pounds spent on that are you going to get that back in the sale value so i think if you're careful you could do them both for five and i think you will get five thousand more Extra bit of work. not only that but if he's to smash the ceiling price everything has to be right on the nail if he gets the bed and bath ratio right he could be in with a chance but having given himself it's only good. eight weeks david really needs to make up his mind and get on with it what are you going to do out here I uh, haven't entirely decided. I mean, I could spend quite a lot of money doing this garden up with new flagstones, decking, et cetera, et cetera, or I could simply tart up the garden relatively inexpensively. Do you know, it seems to me there's a lot of issues with this development where you're not quite sure which way you're going to go, and, and that's your biggest problem with it. You've given up a, a very successful job where you're paid a lot of money to develop full-time, and you need to be successful at it. You need to formulate a plan, make that plan early on, and, and stick to it, because I think if you dither as much as you are dithering, there is a danger that you, you'll never quite make up my, your mind which way you're going, and, and that's a dangerous position to be in. Even more dangerous is not to be around whilst work gets underway. If David really wants to make a living at this, he needs to be on site daily. Instead, he's taking two whole weeks out of his meagre eight-week schedule to go on holiday, leaving his builder and roofer to start without him. I'm John, the builder. Hello, John. Yeah, my name's Alan, the roofer. There's no doorway into the bedroom. Though. Before long, David not being there to answer questions starts to slow them down. It's not normal for somebody who's not here, like, when, when this job is going, it's, it's a bit of a bind, because obviously if anything goes wrong, he's the one who's got to make the decisions. Ideally, David would have been here this week. Some things, like the downstairs toilets and positionings of the upstairs um, cloakroom, uh, the ensuite, um, will have to wait until he gets back next week. By the end of the two weeks, the site is at a virtual standstill. In Poole, Rebecca Lang's project is racing ahead. Hi, this is Alan. Oh, this is Nick, Nick and Steve. She's finding out the hard way just how intense full-time project managing can be, especially with four young children. My feet haven't touched the ground. I have been working incredibly hard. It's just all the planning, all the organising. And although I've been saying to myself, well, you know, I know I've got a few months of really hard work, it's actually here now and it is hard work. I think the only way to get this project finished on time is for me just to be really decisive and make decisions and not wait for things to happen. I've just got to take the ball by the horns and just, just get on with it. Rebecca's decisiveness is really pushing this project forward. The roof's off, the scaffolding's up and the new extension's underway. But she still plans to put fake double doors onto a tiny garage. 
having garage doors with no garage behind it is is a fundamental problem with this house and and you're creating this luxurious contemporary space that doesn't work someone who's prepared to pay three quarters of a million pounds for a house is likely to have a, a very expensive car to go with it and and I think that you need to provide the option of having a garage to put that car in. If they've got the car to match and they've got the sort of money, then I think that they'll think nothing of taking down a wall and saying, I want a double garage, it's a high priority to me. If somebody buys a newly modernised house, it's because they don't want to do any building work. So I don't think it's a very good argument to say that if they want to knock a wall down, they can always do it themselves. I think we're going to have to agree to disagree, aren't we? We are. <laughs> OK, let's see what's left of the rest of the house. OK. Although Rebecca's sticking to her guns over her garage, she did like some of my other ideas. So what I've decided is to have the whole of this side as the master bedroom suite. So you've got the bedroom um, at the back there, so you've got the view. You've got a dressing room in the middle, and then you come into um, the bathroom. So you're going to end up with five bedrooms and three bathrooms. Yes. I think that's, that's a really good layout. Thank you. For a house of this price, it's crucial to be realistic. By putting her master bedroom on this floor, Rebecca will end up with a five-bedroom, three-bathroom house which is just right for her market. But she's not been quite so spot on with her costs. Although she's realistic about her fees at £30,000, most of her other figures are way under what she'll need. For the enormous amount of building work, including a two-storey front extension and a whole new top storey, she's budgeted just £61,000. For all the plumbing and electrics, a woefully inadequate £10,000. She's hoping she can get a top-of-the-range kitchen and three bathrooms for £13,000. Buy all the doors and windows for £15,000 and do her landscaping for £4,000. Worst of all, she's got a mere £11,000 for flooring, fixtures and fittings. And with a tiny contingency of £6,000, her total budget is £150,000. For a project this size, I fear it's way off the mark. I'm not sure she's done any research into what pool buyers expect in terms of finish and how much that all costs. It's time to see what the local competition is offering. And the detailing on this flat is really what carries it, with the balustrading, the banisters, the kitchen, the worktop's lovely, and even the tap. These sort of finishes don't come in at 20, 30 quid or 200, 300 quid a go. You're talking about several thousand pounds here, several thousand pounds there. And, and to get that sort of finish, you get through money fast at yes. that kind of rate. Yes. I mean, on your budget of 150,000, what were you hoping to achieve? I think I was hoping to achieve this. On 150,000, you haven't got a hope in hell of actually achieving this sort of finish. Realistically, you need to be looking at spending at least 250,000 to, to achieve the sort of look that, that the house warrants. I mean, 250,000, that's quarter of a million pounds, it's, it's a huge sum of money. It's not as if you're saying, well, I think you need to spend just another 20,000, you know, 100,000 pounds is an awful lot of money. I think what you really need to do now is, is A, talk to agents about whether you can get more for your house, but B, also work out how feasible it is to find more money, because I think you do need to spend a lot more money. It's just a question of where it comes from. Absolutely. <laughs> In this exclusive location, only perfection can command the highest prices. If Rebecca's place doesn't match up, she's in danger of making no profit at all. In Crouch End, David's back from holiday looking relaxed, only to discover that progress isn't as advanced as he'd hoped. Yes, I couldn't really go in much further than this, David, because um, obviously we don't know where the wall's going to come, the stud wall's going to come for the ensuite. Considering David's livelihood is dependent on this project finishing in five weeks, he's possibly not taking things as seriously as he should be. Do you think that, um, that 
perhaps it wasn't such a great idea to go away just as the site was beginning. Oh, I had a great holiday. <laughs> no, no, I bet <laughs> you the did. holiday was booked a year ago. There's no way we wouldn't even consider dropping a holiday. I mean, what's life about? It's not about work. I think that's the thing about being self-employed. You kind of have to take the holidays where you can. There is no way. I hope you'd agree with me here. There's no way we'd ever prioritise work over that precious two weeks that we take every year. If you're going to project manage a site and you're going to develop, you need to make sure that while the project's running, you're there on site all the time. I mean, generally, I'd agree with you, but I think you know it worked OK this time, unless I was doing a very complicated development next time much more complicated than this. I don't see any reason why I couldn't do the same again. David's attitude to his new career is pretty laid back. But what's more, he still hasn't finalised his plans. What exactly are you going to do here? You're talking about some cloakroom or...? Yes. At the moment, Christine and I are slightly in disagreement. She thinks it's probably not worth the hassle. I suspect Christine will probably get her way. <laughs> she often does. Well, really, the choice is up to you, David. I mean, whether or not you proceed with it, All right. go ahead. It didn't have to. David must make some speedy decisions. And he's got to think carefully about what's going to make this house worth more than any other on the street, because he's got some stiff competition. Are you confident that you're going to get 450000 asking price for this? Um, I'm reasonably confident. There aren't many houses of this size in the area, so there's a view that, you know, maybe a three-bedroom house would get snapped up fairly quickly. I found quite a bit on the market that's just underneath 400,000. I brought some details along to show you. 384 is an immaculate Victorian three bedroom house. 369, these are all newly modernised. The only way you're going to achieve a lot more than all of these houses, which are all on the market at under 400,000, is if you tick every single possible box you could for a three bedroom house. And that involves having an ensuite, which you've ticked. That's great, you've done that. Um, having a big kitchen breakfast room, that's great, you've done that. Having a downstairs loo, I think is, it's a mistake not to have a downstairs loo, because that's one box not ticked. And to have a really fun, cool, contemporary interior that you're not going to get with another house. For the kind of young family market, yes, they expect a good finish, but at the same time, they're probably wanting to feel they're also getting value for money. They and do want value for money, and, and I think that the problem is, is value for money is going to be one of these at under, you know, 375, 390. And to make them pay the extra 50, 60,000 for this house, you've got to offer a lot more. David eventually decides against putting in a loo. Size 12. As a new career, he's now throwing all his energy into learning the trade. His decision to work as a full-time labourer on site is a good start. My apprentice is doing very well. He's done, he's done excellent so far. Um, he's going to have a little go at a bit of bricklaying soon. <laughs> and thinks it's easy. David's learning and things are speeding up. But with only four weeks left, has it come too late for him to meet his deadline? In pool, Rebecca's problems won't be so easily solved. She's desperately under-budgeted and has finally realised the only way forward is to spend more money. Had agents in, they've now valued the property 750,000, possibly even 775,000 pounds when finished, provided I spec it right, I spend the money on the finishing touches. I'm actually going to borrow another 40,000 pounds to spend on this project. Although there's a lot more money to borrow, I, I think it is the right decision. It's obvious, but scary. She's decided she will up the spend. £40,000 is a healthy sum, but it won't stretch far enough on a project of this scale. In Crouch End, David Hollingworth is five weeks into the eight-week development of his three-bed end of terrace. The major work is done, the house is plastered, and it's time to decorate. Or it would be if David and Christine knew what they wanted. I think I do have quite nice taste, and therefore, um, 
I do want to be involved in obviously all the decisions. It means that when I've made a decision on something we then have to go through the loop again while Christine puts her input in and we'll discuss it long enough to the extent that Christine will make me think it's my idea even though it was hers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we'll, we'll end up with something that I'll be selling as my decision but actually she's the one who's sown the seed in my mind. I like to leave decisions to the last minute and have as long as possible to think about things. If only they had that luxury. With three weeks to go, David has to press on. To achieve top whack, he needs to offer a fabulous contemporary finish. And when decisions are finally made, I hope they're the right ones. So have you got any idea what you're going to do upstairs? Well, we're wanting a colour that's obviously not too dark um, and is different from cream. So the two ideas we've got are pale lemon and a pale lilac. I can't think of a nice way to say this, apart from the fact that I hate <laughs> lilac. <laughs> I mean, do you have confidence in, in your ideas? We're, we're not designers. We're really not designers. We like... We have very plain taste ourselves. I don't like anything fancy. Um, yeah, I would go for plain rather than patterned every time. I think it's absolutely crucial that you have more than, than a cream house. It needs mm -hmm. to be something really special because for the figure that you're trying to get for the house it's it's designed rather than just modernized getting the look right for your market can be daunting for a first-time developer but there is research you can do so if you're in a trendy area start by visiting local kitchen and bathroom showrooms to see what's hot and what's not Check local estate agents' particulars to see what is selling and why. Make sure you read interior design magazines that are aimed at your market. So if you're selling in trendy urban North London, don't buy magazines aimed at country cottages. If all else fails, some big stores such as Habitat, Laura Ashley and John Lewis offer interior design services for around £200 a consultation. Getting the look right is the key to a successful development. And that's something that Rebecca in Poole has begun to realise. Armed with the extra £40,000 she's negotiated, she's hitting the design shops. So how much is this bar? This one's 799 But as I suspected, £40,000 doesn't go far in a high-end market. It is way over my budget, but it really is going to create the look that I want for the property. When you're talking a designer kitchen, three top-end bathrooms and a house full of high-spec furnishings, it's not long before £40,000 has disappeared. And Rebecca's not even close to finishing. I'm quite excited because I've ordered a lovely fireplace, but I have gone way over budget, so I'd only budgeted £600. Um, and this has come up at virtually £2,000. So, yes, I've gone over budget, but I think it was worth it. The, the house needed a fireplace such as this. It's got to be finished off properly. So, I'm glad I've done it. Now desperately needing to cut costs, Rebecca has decided to get the project finished as quickly as she can. She takes the radical step of employing all the different trades at the same time, but the site becomes bedlam. There's lots of um, people around. In fact, it's quite hard to keep tabs on everyone. There's more and more people arriving each day. I've got electricians here, first fix plumbing. I've got windows going in, got a couple of window guys here. Chippies, still got the builders here, doing brickwork, putting the roof timbers up. So it's, it's really getting quite busy here on site. This is going to need incredibly careful management. She wants to get everything done in one well, as quickly as possible, which is a bit of a nightmare because obviously you've got people in the way. I mean, we, we were trying to get the windows through yesterday and there was plumbers on the floor, there was wires everywhere. There's always people in the way on any site, but this one's a bit, a bit more crowded. Luckily, Rebecca's impressive project management skills keep everyone on track, but she's still got an awful lot of money to find. Is it quite worrying, the fact that you've got to find this money? Very worrying, yeah. I can't pretend otherwise. I think the key with a budget 
when you do realise that it's completely unrealistic, is to get ahead of the game and not try and bury your head in the sand. I think the first thing to do is go back to your bank and see if they will increase your lending. The second thing that you need to bear in mind is that although in your budget you've got your estate agent's fees for selling it and your solicitor's fees for, for selling it, you don't actually have to pay that till you sell. So that part of the budget you can happily spend because it's not a cost that goes out till you've got yeah. the cash from the yeah. sale. Also, when you do talk to the bank, I think it's worth asking them if they'd be happy to roll over the interest payments monthly till the end of the project, which will loosen up another big chunk of, of money. I mean, I wouldn't normally advise anyone to just spend more money, but I think in your case, your development in this area, it's worth spending the extra money because I think you will reap the rewards when you come to sell it. I've come this far and I kind of can't stop now. I have to carry on, so bank manager tomorrow morning. Over in Crouch End, with just one week to go, David's turned his attention to the final look of his house. It's definitely well worth spending some money out here and some time yeah. to make sure that this is, this is a really attractive house from outside on the pavement because as people walk up, you want them to think, God, oh, this really is the house that I yeah. want. The other thing you can do with a Victorian terrace is make sure that the front door gives a really good impression as yeah. people walk up to it. You're lucky because you've got the original front door and I think if you put some really contemporary door furniture on it, yeah. you'd have a really good first impression as people walk yeah. up to it. I mean, I'm halfway through replacing it, as you can see. <laughs> oh, are you going to keep I've it got, in brass? Know, yes. Do you not think that you need to be a bit more with it? What's wrong with brass? Well, You're not going to like it's very 80s, handles, then, isn't you? it? Don't you think? Well, it's a Victorian house. No, I mean 1980s, not <laughs> 1880s. <laughs> Original detailing would be fine, but if it is reproduction, it's safer to go contemporary. I notice you've got brass lever door handles. Yes. They look a bit cheap for this sort of development. And I think if you're wanting to get top whack again, it would be better to have painted doors and good solid door furniture that looks really chunky. A straw poll of various friends sort of indicated a kind of bit of a split between, you know, quite a lot of people actually like the, the pine finish rather, you know, the natural finish rather than painted. Do they live in the countryside though? No, London. Um, well, do they live in Islington? No, we don't know anyone that trendy. <laughs> <laughs> and are they kind of in their, their mid-30s? Uh, not really, no. So they're not necessarily going to be the sort of people who are likely to actually buy this house? No. It's about creating an overall look that's going to get you the maximum price, and to do that, you need it to be very 2005. Right. Another worry is that David's builders pack up tomorrow, leaving him to finish the job single-handed. If this was my site, we'd be having a firm of decorators in for three, four weeks at this stage. Well, I'm I'd planning to do the decorating myself. There's a lot to do for you on your own. I'll do it. You're an amazing guy. <laughs> <laughs> I know. No, I mean, seriously, I'll be working, I will be working long hours. Um, yeah, I'm fairly confident I'll get it done. With a pretty vague design plan and no workers to help him finish, I'm worried David could miss both his deadline and his market. He has no choice but to work 20-hour days himself. And finally, he has to rope in the rest of his family as extra labour. David, this really isn't coming off very easily. It is, hard, it is really hard work. Obviously, we're all really tired because it's been absolutely full on for the last couple of weeks. David's been here really late every night. I've been coming after work and we've all been here at weekends. So um, it's, it's tiring, but there is an end in sight. So uh, we're, we're getting there. In Poole, Rebecca Lang is still a long way off. But thanks to a bigger overdraft and her credit cards, she now has the extra £60,000 she needs. But the stress is taking its toll. I have to say, I am constantly tired because 
trying to fit it all in, looking after the children, running the house and um, running the development. It does take time and something has to give and unfortunately it's sleep. I do go to bed very, very late and I have to be up early the next morning. Rebecca's got her family's livelihood riding on this development. She has to be successful. In Crouch End, David and Christine have finished their development, impressively only two weeks behind schedule. They've turned a run-down, dated house into a desirable three-bed family home. Whilst they've played safe in some rooms, they have also used their lemon and lilac schemes, which may put some off. But despite the colour, it's still a success. And whilst they were quite right to put in an ensuite, the decor may not appeal to their market. I think you had a bold moment with your border tiles. Oh, Sorry, what do you mean by bold? <laughs> They're very bold. Things they look like classic that. and Roman to me. <laughs> <laughs> is classic or Roman. <laughs> Downstairs, the bigger, lighter kitchen with its doors to the garden is a great selling point. And it has a remarkably cool, contemporary feel. It's a great kitchen breakfast room. I mean, this is a lovely, light, big room mm. and with doors out into the garden. That's what everyone wants, so you've given it to them. In terms of layout, this house has got everything you could possibly want, perhaps with the exception of a downstairs loo, ideally, in an <laughs> ideal world. And it just is the last box that could be ticked. Mm. Well, I think in a perfect world, there would have been a bit more space and perhaps a bit more time, in which case I probably would have done it. Would do you regret not doing it? Taking on board everything you've said, we still think it, for this house, this, is the, this was the right decision not to put one in. The whole house is a dramatic improvement but they may have limited their market slightly. Well, this is a, a really lovely room. And, and I think the only thing I would say about this is that I think you've gone down the contemporary route, which is perfect for the market that you're appealing to. You kind of half went there in terms mm -hmm. of the design and then slightly chickened yeah. out. The shame is that you didn't have the courage to change the door handles and light mm -hmm. switch. I think if you'd gone that little yeah. step further, it would have ticked the contemporary design box, whilst being a Victorian terrace, because mm. it is traditional. I can those are such minor things. I mean, you're talking about 10 or 20 quid a door to change them. If someone really doesn't like what we've got, it's not going to stop them buying the house, I don't think. And, you know, they can change those if they really want to. Their hard work means they've come in at only £4,000 over budget, which is an impressive achievement. But is it enough to persuade the agents that this house is worth the £450,000 they're hoping for? The ensuite bathroom is a definite plus. Tiles may be a little bit heavy on the border. It may have helped the wow factor if they've gone a bit more contemporary. Nice and bright windows everywhere, very contemporary. Exactly what families are looking for with the French doors leading out to the garden. It's generally I'd have liked it to have been a bit more vibrant, a bit more funky, perhaps. Well, there's potential for a downstairs cloakroom. The brass power points along with the brass door handles are very old-fashioned. I would value this property at £440,000. I value this property at £450,000. Now, uh, we have had some agents around and they came in with an average valuation of 445,000. Mm -hmm. If you did sell at 445,000, you would make a 50,000 pound profit, which is a 12% return. I actually feel slightly disappointed now. Obviously, when I started, 450 was what I was aiming for. Mm -hmm. That would still be okay, but now we've kind of maybe hoping we'd get a bit more for it. At the beginning of this project, you were wanting a better quality of life. Do you think mm. this has given you a better quality of life? Not the last month. The last, last month, it hasn't given us any life at all. I, th I think if you average it out over the past six months, the total amount of work I've done is probably no more, in fact, probably quite a lot less than I used to do. Yeah. But obviously it's all been crammed um, together yeah. in this last month, really. What would you do differently next time around? 
I think I probably wouldn't send the builders home quite so early. I think it's worth saying for the next one, it, it might be easier to be more ruthless, make decisions earlier on and stick with them a bit, a bit more gung-ho, really, with your decisions. Really bear in mind the local market and what people want. And I think in terms of the style and interior, probably do more, more and more research. You've done really well. And I think that you've made a profit, so you're on the start to making this a career, which I think is all hats off to you as well. So. Thank you. <laughs> in Poole, Rebecca Lang's project is in its final stages. But if she can't pull off the high-spec finish she needs, her profit is far from assured. For a first-time developer taking on the exacting standards of Poole Harbour, Rebecca Lang couldn't have picked a less inspiring building. But four months of stress, long hours and financial juggling later, her 70s house can now hold its head high amongst its exclusive neighbours. I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. I think, really, the house is unrecognisable to what it was. In facelift terms, this is a really successful one. Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy how, how it looks. Is it's... it as good as you expected? I think it's pretty much what I expected, but it's always reassuring, especially when the big scaffold um, hoods came down, and then you think, yeah, this is, this is what I wanted. I noticed that you've got the double garage doors, but without a, a garage depth. Do you regret that at all? I don't lose sleep over it. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, but I've gained other things. I've gained an office, I've gained some storage area. I just feel that any family that would want to buy this house, if that area wasn't there, they'd think, it's lovely, but... Where are we going to hang our coats? And they might have smart cars. And they might have smart cars, exactly. <laughs> Two of them. <laughs> Rebecca had to do something dramatic, and she has. She's turned an unprepossessing four-bed house into a luxurious five-bed with stunning living areas. The sitting room is now thoroughly modern, and the new extension means she has an extra reception room, which will really add value. The old kitchen has been transformed into a model of contemporary living. Rebecca agonised over spending more than her budget, but I think it's a gamble that will pay off. This is clearly where a lot of the money's been spent downstairs because the finishes are top end and, and it looks absolutely spectacular with, with this gorgeous worktop and the staircase and the glass door. I have to say I have splashed out on, on the kitchen. It has swallowed up a bigger part of the budget than I had anticipated. It's exactly the sort of chic finish that yes. the pool market will demand. And, and because you've managed to achieve that, you will stand the best possible chance of getting the best possible sale price. Rebecca wisely moved the master bedroom to the first floor. The extra space has enabled her to really go to town. The bedroom is stylish, having a walk-in dressing room is a sophisticated touch, and the ensuite bathroom is pure luxury. So, I mean, I think as a, as a master suite for a luxury family home, this certainly achieves everything you could possibly want to achieve. Your finish is, is absolutely spot on. I'm really happy with how this um, whole area has um, turned out. It's almost exceeded my every expectation. This is going to be a major selling feature when you come to sell this house. Good. <laughs> the new third floor now has two extra bedrooms and another bathroom, giving her the ultimate layout for a big family home. But her budget did suffer. Rebecca originally budgeted £61,000 for her building work. In fact, it came in at £105,000. Plumbing and electrics also rose to £18,000. Kitchen and bathrooms came in at £34,000. Doors and windows at £32,000. Her landscaping has more than trebled to £14,500. Flooring, fixtures and fittings more than doubled to £26,500. In fact, the only place she stuck to her budget was on her fees, which remained at £30,000. It all comes to a whopping £260,000. 
But Rebecca's budget was never realistic. And even though she spent £110,000 more than she originally intended, I think this house is now worth much more than the £650,000 she expected. Great first impressions. That's an absolutely fantastic ensuite. I think overall it's a, a, a marvellous master bedroom suite. Oh, that's a shame. Couldn't get a car in here and that could put buyers off. It's a lovely feature, nice sliding door dividing the rooms. Nice kitchen. Good work surfaces, good breakfast area for the family. I value this property at £775,000. I'd market this property at £725,000. I value this property at £795,000. Now, down to money, though, because obviously this is what it's all about. Yeah. <laughs> As a gut feeling, what, what do you reckon that it's worth? So if it was under 700, I'd be very disappointed. And if it right. was under 665,000, I'd be in trouble. We've had three agents round, and they valued it at an average of 765,000 pounds. Oh, thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that would give you 100,000 yeah. pounds profit from this development. Does that make it worthwhile? I think it makes it very worthwhile. But as always, it all depends on the buyers. This is lovely. Beautiful high ceilings. That's a lovely feature of the glass door, isn't it? Yeah. That's really spacious. Yeah. Very modern. I really thought it was spacious. supposed to be a garage. You couldn't get anything in. We're lucky to get a bike in it. That's oh, I love this yes. fire. Yeah, yeah it's slab lovely. Fireplace, very nice. Not sure about the blue though. But... Oh, unusual bathroom. This is really nice. I like this. What a two-man shower. Yeah, I like that a lot. I love the outlook. Could lie in bed looking out in the garden. It's nice, open. nice with the tariffs. Would you do another one? Yes, I think I would. I think I need to hibernate for a few months now and just catch up on some sleep. I think you could make a successful career out of developing because I think you, you do have a great design eye and I think that you're very good at managing a project. The only thing I would say is that I think you need to be more realistic next time round about how much you need to spend to create a top-end finish or whatever finish you're trying to achieve. Well, I think that's something I've learnt upon the way, really, and that I will take with me next, next time. time. Five months later, Rebecca has put in an offer on another property, as has David in Crouch End, after selling his for £460,000. Next week, I'm in London with some new developers who have some very different ideas. I spend sleepless nights listening to you going over and over and over in my head. I am going to actually refuse to allow you <laughs> to use this.